this is the 10th course of our computer aided archaeology course and uh, this session we will talk about C14 calibration a topic that you have heard during your studies quite often I think in this video I will present to you the theoretical background what is C14 what are isotopes why can we measure time with that and uh, what are the difficulties in the specific um, atomic clock that we can use um, and you will also see a bit about the um, actual calculation how you can get ages from this radioactive decay and in the practical part I will show you with the help of Oxcal how you can do the calibration on your own I think you have heard this um, at least the, the theoretical part quite often so we'll try to keep it on the shorter side giving us more time to talk about the actual calibration process in Oxcal so um, to start off each elements um, of um, matter consists of isotopes and at least every element has at least one isotope and that's uh, the, the stable and natural form in which we can observe that. Isotopes come from the uh, fact, the name comes from the fact that they are represented at the same place in the periodic table because whatever Cons um, matters in respect of isotopes and different isotopes uh, concerns the atomic core while the chemical attributes and the chemical features are only governed by the um, electrons that uh, rotate around the core or are placed in, in spheres around the core and so whenever we have the same number of electrons we have the same element and these different isotopes behave essentially uh, chemically in the same way but they have different um, physical features one of them is that they have different masses the other one is that some of them might have an instable core and so they decay and emit radioactive um, particles or radiation and so this is the part where some unstable isotopes um, are concerned and C14 is an unstable isotope of carbon Isotopes differ by their mass, so by their atomic mass, and um, the mass is a, is the number of the elements of the of the particles in the nucleus, in the in the core of the uh, atoms. So um, we have protons and neutrons in the core, and um, the the total number of them represents the atomic mass. Elements are defined by the atomic number, that is the number of protons and thus the electrons that are present in a specific atom. And when uh, there are more protons in the core, of course, um, to have a neutral element, a neut neutral atom, we have to have also more electrons and by that um, we have the same place in the periodic table because then these different isotopes will behave chemically essentially the same. Um, the variable uh, variable within an element and thus with the uh, isotopes forming the isotopes are the different uh, neutrons that uh, are also part of the atomic core. So the atomic number is given at the usually at the bottom left by convention so 6c is carbon but usually this is omitted because when we talk about carbon is it is meant that we talk about uh, the element that has six protons so with that uh, usually we just talk about carbon the mass number is usually given on the top left here and f by convention so um, if we have 14 C that's uh, carbon 14 or the radioactive uh, carbon that is essentially interesting for us and you can also have both numbers given together 14 then gives the number of um, particles in the nucleus while the 6 gives the number of protons here and then we have this complete um, notation but usually we go just with carbon if we talk about the standard carbon and if we talk about the isotope we talk about the 14C we have also 12C this uh, carbon 12 and um, 13c this carbon 13 
which both are stable isotopes, so they do not decay, while carbon-14 is radioactive and it decays after a certain time. So here, if we would have that in presence, I would have a small test. If we see this here, 16 uh, um, atomic mass, but 8 uh, number of protons, then we talk about um, something that has uh, 8 electrons and 8 protons and here we see the O so it's oxygen and it has an atomic number of 8 so 8 protons and 8 electrons and it has an, a mass of 16 which means in the core we have 8 protons and 8 neutrons so that's uh, the ordinary oxygen that we breathe all the time. Um, isotopes can come in different quantities in the natural surroundings. So usually if we have stable isotope, also their um, uh, composition is stable in respect of their um, of the actual uh, isotope, but they can change and that's something over time due to other radioactive decays. And that's something wha what we use, for example, in strontium when we have the possibility to get some information about um, uh, provenance from the different ratios of um, of strontium by which we actually measure the age of the um, of the uh, rocks on which people lived. In case of carbon we have um, this carbon-12 as the ordinary carbon which makes 99% of the total carbon. We have the stable isotope 13C, which makes about 1% of the total carbon. And then we have the unstable isotopes, and there are not only uh, carbon-14, but we have others that are also unstable. We have, for example, carbon-10, which has a half-life of 20 seconds. So after 20 seconds, half of the uh, carbon-10 is um, gone and decayed. We have carbon-11, which has a half-life of 20 minutes. And then we have carbon 15, which has a half-life of 0 0.7 seconds, and then we have carbon-14, which has a half-life which is totally different from all the other half-lives. It's much more stable. It has 5,730 5 years of half-life, um, but still um, it is rare compared to all the other stable components. So C10, C11, and so you will rarely find, um, but C14 we will find in the natural surrounding. It's it's very rare. So uh, for 1.5 times 10 to the 12 atoms of carbon-12, we will have one atom carbon-14. Or if we uh, have 10 single houses filled with sand, there will be only one single grain that would be different, that would be carbon-14 in that case. So it's very rare. And as it decays, it goes out of um, being in, in in present. So there must be some kind of mechanism to reproduce again carbon-14 so that we have a stable situation like we have that in our lived environment here and what it is. You probably know already but we will come to that a bit later. So half-life we talked about that. Um, that's connected to the process of radioactive decay and radioactive decay is a process that takes place in the nucleus by random chance with a different probability. And that means, so it's, it's nuclear physics, it's um, very, very in uninfluenced, uninfluenced by any surrounding activities. No chemical process will um, is able to increase or decrease radioactive decay. It takes place on a stable but not very um, predictive manner for the single atoms, but since it is so, um, yeah, taking place at at a constant rate, um, if we look at larger amounts of matter, we can have a quite a good assumption not when the individual atom will decay, but when a certain amount of these atoms have decayed, and this is in uh, also independent from any other physical attributes like temperature or pressure um, or where the, this isotope is located on Earth, it will always take place with a certain speed. 
So and this seed is measured in half life, so that's the time when half of the specific um, isotope has decayed. In so in our case, if only half of the original material uh, of the decaying isotope is still present, then we have one half life. So after one half life, half of the matter will be decayed. After two half lives, there's only one third left, and after eight half lives, there's uh, one two hundred fifty sixth of the original amount of C14 uh, present. So that means for C14 after 10 half-lives, that's 50,000 years, there's only one thousandth, um, one out of thousand objects or atoms of C14 left in the total gross um, mean of the decay. We cannot never predict when an individual atom will decay, but for a larger amount we have a good, pretty good um, knowledge about when a certain amount of these atoms will have decayed. Um, and with that of course we can measure how much time has passed since there was the full amount of um, this isotope present. There are other interesting half-lives for archaeology or for geology. For example different uraniums have half-lives with which we can measure processes that take place on um, let's say um, th the time since the beginning of our solar system or since the formation of Earth. Then we have potassium, argon, um, potassium that is also uh, possible to be used within process of the total Earth but um, uh, probably also for smaller um, time ranges when it comes to the evolution of the human species, for example, these kind of um, isotopes might be interesting in respect to their half-life. There's also argon-40, which has a half-life of 269 years, so that might be interesting for rather short time spans, but carbon-14 with this 5700 uh, covers larger parts or with measurable um, differences larger parts of what is interesting for prehistoric prehistoric archaeology and that's why it's it's very helpful uh, in respect of the half-life and since it's carbon and we will see that later because it's part of a living matter it's also very helpful for us to date organisms and with that um, things that are in the vicinity of human activities so why can we calculate half-lives? As I said, radioactive substances decay purely by chance, but the isotopes differ with uh, their probability of decaying. So um, this is a certain average lifetime of the individual object. And um, there are always many, many decays taking place at the same time. As I said, we cannot predict when a specific object or a specific atom will decay. But uh, we have a lot of C14, although in general we have very, very little amount of C14 in total. But since we all matter is composited of so many atoms, uh, this is not so much a problem. So if we s have one gram of pure C14, we would have uh, this large number, uh, which are, I don't know, quadrillions of decays per second. And if we have uh, one gram of fresh carbon as it is um, we would have still approximately 5 million decays per second so there is a large number of decays taking place uh, all the time and we need rather small amounts of um, mass to, to get a decent large number and if we have a large number um, there is this law of large number the more random events uh, take place the closer the result will be to the mean value and the mean value here, for example, can be expressed in half-lives. So the quintessence for that is radioactive substances disintegrate very evenly on average. So they represent an excellent stopwatch for uh, having an idea when certain processes or how long certain processes took. Um, the more there is, the better is the stopwatch. The reason is that the uncertainty increases. This is the reason why the uncertainty increases with old samples. Uh, but for most of the parts that we are interested in, that's not a serious um, difficulty. And it becomes exp 
exponentially less. So the reduction is exponentially. Another reason why the uncertainty increases with all samples. And we see why this is the case, especially for measurements errors later on. If we want to have a good isotope, a radioactive isotope for dating, then, or if we have this basic idea, then our task is to find a radioactive substance that having a reasonable half-life for our dating problem and can be also connected to what we want to date in a meaningful way. So C14 is has a meaningful uh, half-life for us and it's also connected to things in the living atmosphere, so with activities of human beings. And now we need only need some difficulty and uh, complex devices for measuring that. We need complex devices and um, there are sim more simple ones but they are not so um, accurate. So the more money you throw on this problem, probably the better will be your measurement. But there is a certain limit to every measurement and um, this money goes most of the time to reduce this amount of measurement error. But uh, there is a specific limit to in which you can decrease that. Measurement errors in radiometric dating, but in general, are usually expressed in what is called standard deviation. The reason for that is also here, um, if we have processes that um, are the result of multiple mixed errors, um, you will get a distribution of this error that is um, shaped like this essentially. So we have quite a lot of measurements that will be very close to what we would like to measure or the actual value. And we have some that are more distant from the actual, there will be a larger error. And the larger the error is, the more rare the um, a me measurement of this error will be. So most of the our measurements are not so far from the actual um, from the actual value that we would like to measure. And <coughs> these measurement errors behave in this bell-shaped form, which is also called the normal distribution. And this normal distribution has uh, some nice features because it's very predictable how this measurement error will take place. 68% um, of the values will lie within what is called one standard deviation here. And 95% of the measurements will lie in this 95% uh, in, in these two standard deviations and so on and so forth. That's why where the sigma value comes from that we see when we talk about C14 dating or any other dating that relies on uh, radioactive decay. And that's something that comes usually from the measurement device. Uh, how big this standard deviation might be, that might be a bit different. Um, the larger your measurement device will be, the better your measurement device will be, but you will never have a perfect measurement uh, that gives you the result on the spot. So we will always have this kind of measurement error. And um, yeah, the larger this is, the more uncertain your measurement will be. The second problem that we have is um, these devices have a fixed measurement error, fixed standard deviation for the error. And this you can compare that to a stopwatch. If you uh, if you measure um, the pace or the time for running, um, it doesn't matter if you run just 100 meter or 10k, um, the inaccuracy of pressing the stopwatch will always be the same. Um, so if you have more kilometers or more time, compared to the amount of time that you're measuring, your measurement error will be smaller. For example, uh, here, if we have an accelerator, a measurement device that has a uncertainty of plus minus 200 nuclei or 200 isotopes, um, it measures the amount of isotopes rather good, uh, but it always have plus minus 200. If we now measure 40,000 atomic nuclei, so probably something that is just fresh, fresh C14 or fresh carbon, we will have uh, our measurement error of 200. That means we have 0.5% of the measured value of this 40,000 as an error. And that's not so much an error. Um, that's in, in the range of 1% uh, uh, around what we actually would like to measure. So the differences of different measurements will be very similar. 
but after one half life the measurement error stays the same but now it is just it's one percent of the measured value because we have now half the total amount of, of nuclei and uh, the same error will produce a uh, relative error that's bigger after two half lives we have already two percent and after five, five half lives we have 16 percent of uh, error compared to the total measurement error that we have while the absolute measurement will always be have the same uncertainty that's the reason why the older a sample gets the higher the uncertainty will be no matter how good your measurement device is because you always have a certain measurement error and with lesser material to be measured this error becomes more significant in the total okay let's go back for a uh, second and talk about the history of the C14 measurements so C14 was already is already known as a um, radioactive isotope um, probably since the early 30s of the 19 of the 20th century and here it was assumed that it's rather short-lived with a half-life from 1 to 1000 years so a lot of uncertainty here still and it was assumed that it's not naturally occurring but a process that comes from radioactive decay of other elements then um, Ernest O. Lawrence who won the Nobel Prize in 1990 uh, 1939 um, discovered that it should have a longer half-life so it should be more than a thousand years and he assumed that it would come from the production by neutron absorption on uh, nitrogen on standard nitrogen that we breathe in the air if this uh, absorbs a neutron it becomes a different uh, element and with that it would be C14 um, then there was in the 1930s again some experiments so this there was the, uh, the theoretical part on that that we now have a better understanding of the half-life and what the process could have been to produce C14 and on the practical part there were some experiments with balloons and uh, they were on high altitudes and uh, Serge Korf discovered that neutrons are also transmitted by cosmic radiation from the Sun or from distant stars and so um, he could explain that C14 is naturally occurring as isotope in the atmosphere from this process involving nitrogen. Then there is uh, the person that's always named in connection to C14, that's Libby, who built the first Geiger counter, a device of to measure C14 uh, radioactive decay in the United States. And he also believed that neutrons are the trigger for the production of C14 and he had some uh, assumptions of the half-life that was already a bit narrower from uh, 100 to 10,000 years and he tried to um, measure that s very specifically with special Geiger counter um, construction that um, shielded the actual counts of the element that he wanted to count against the cosmic radiation that go through all of us and also would influence these measurements of very little decays. I will not go into detail how this construction is, but it's essentially two uh, counter tubes within each other. And uh, if we measure in the outer tube uh, a decay, then this is from cosmic radiation. He also formulated the basic idea how um, the whole process of C14 cons um, production and uh, decay probably would look like so he said that in the up upper atmosphere by cosmic rays we have uh, the production of um, C14 by the absorption of a neutron uh, or the replacement of a proton by a neutron in um, nitrogen as would result in C14 which oxidize and becomes CO2 and CO2 this time radioactive CO2 is integrated by photosynthesis into plants and by eating these plants into animals and by eating these animals also into humans. It could also dissolve in the ocean which means also that we will have older uh, radiocarbon 
in the ocean than in the land masses. All the time the decay takes place, so C14 decays by emitting uh, a better particle to, again, nitrogen. Uh, but since there is a constant production, this is uh, replaced by new C14 and we have a stable situation here. Only if matter dies and there is no interaction with the atmosphere any longer, the decay is the only res uh, remaining process and by that the stopwatch starts ticking. He tested that out with archaeological samples and for example um, or he used um, known ages from history of different uh, pharaohs, um, already tree rings that he could use and by that he produced a first curve that represents the um, decay of radioactive carbon and he came up with a half-life of 5720 plus minus 47 years which is not too bad considering the fact that we now talk about a uh, very similar half-life for our samples. Um, this resulted in uh, a publication and it was the beginning of C14 dating because with that there was very high hopes that now we are able to um, measure organic matter and by that archaeological samples in a very high precision. The problem occurred later when systematic errors in dating ancient Egypt was noticeable. Um, now the, the accuracy was improved and by that these uh, systematic errors became obvious and Libby first suggested that there was something wrong with the history with the ethologists and they were on the wrong side and um, this caused an yeah discussion at that time or a very hefty very uh, intense discussion that um, was a problem until rather 20 years or so when there are still some people that um, were forced in the trenches because of this severity uh, with which this discussion was held. First tests on longer dendro series confirmed then the systematic errors and so this was the beginning when we started talking about C14 years when it came to the measurements of the C14 decay in contrast to solar years which uh, is what we also could call calendar years the years that are according to our measures. Um, the first continuous and detailed documented series uh, was in investigated by Seuss and he could show larger effects long-term trends when this uh, deviation between calendar years and C14 years took place but uh, there was also complex short-term influence that resulted in this um, wiggly shape of the re uh, ratio between carbon years and solar years and that is uh, from where actually our calibration curves comes. So again um, I will go shortly over that. The production of C14 takes up in the upper atmosphere by cosmic rays and nitrogen is converted into C14 um, by replacing a proton with a nitron, uh, not neutron. And then the decay starts already um, at this time. But since there is constant production, uh, there is constant replacement. Then um, plants and animals take in the C, uh, C14 by the means of CO2 and um, as long as we are in contact with the atmosphere uh, this uh, C14 is replaced by flash C14 the decay starts already at the produ production with a half-life of 4730 years and uh, the C14 decays again to nitrogen um, as long as we have a balanced metabolism with the atmosphere this is replaced and if uh, there is no metabolism any longer the um, ratio changes only due to decay and we can start dating by the difference from what we would expect in a living organism. How Now can we calculate the DH of a sample? This decay process like many other processes in nature 
follows an exponential curve that can be expressed by a specific number that's this Euler number and with the help of the Euler number we can calculate how this process in general takes place so if we have a certain amount of atoms at death the time is zero then uh, after one half life only half of these atoms are still present and this can be written as a general exponential function that describes this curve here so the number of atoms at time t will be equal to the number of atoms at time zero at the death of the specimen times the Euler number to um, a specific constant that is um, specific for the different isotopes and times the time uh, after um, which uh, this decay started and we can use this formula to calculate these kind of curves here now if we use our half-life um, we can determine k we know this half-life we can determine this number k here by just changing the formula so if we have a half-life of 4730 we can calculate the number at which the curve would go through the point when 50 percent of the radiocarbon is only present and the number k here turns out to be minus 0 0.000121 that means if we want to calculate how much um, radiocarbon is still present we need 100% um, times the Euler number to this constant times the time and we can also change this formula for time so if we um, have a specific sample with where we know that a specific number percentage of original radiocarbon is still there we can set these values into our formula so 30 percent 30 percent are still there and that should equal to 100 times the Euler number times our constant times t and now we can bit by bit move things to the other side of the equation and then we would have um, the logarithm of 0 0.139 which is the counter um, procedure for um, this to the power of and then we come up with this 1640 uh, one, 116,488 SDH of the sample where there is only 13% there so that would be an ideal world where there were no negative influences and none of these um, deviations that we have seen already in the calibration curve so if we would have only this process uh, of uh, constant um, and steady production of C14 and constant and steady incorporating into living matter we would have really simple straightforward formula to calculate the age of a certain archaeological um, object given that we know how much C14 is in this object but things are more complicated there are different influences one of the main influence is the Earth's magnetic field that changes in long-term cycles over time and the uh, magnetic field influences how much solar radiation is um, goes into the atmosphere and if there is more or less solar radiation then there is more or less production of C14 and this changes the amount of available C14 in the atmosphere also solar activities themselves change independently from our magnetic field there is a well-known cycle of 22 years uh, of more or less activity of the Sun and um, but there are other cycles that are not so well known and not so predictable and this also changes the production of C14 other in, um, influences can be the burning of, uh, of um, ca carbon fossils because with that we um, release old C14 or old carbon into the atmosphere and with that we change uh, the amount of C14 in the atmosphere same goes for volcanoes um, atomic bomb tests change the um, radiation in the atmosphere and by that also the production of C14 climate changes and changes in the uh, 
in the oceans can also bring up old carbon and all these processes work together in a very very complex way changing the, uh, the amount of C14 that was in place when a certain animal or a human died in the past and by that also s starts the clock at different times so how can we counter these effects one possibility would be to calculate all the possible effects and create transfer formulas so that we know how much um, C14 was all the time in the atmosphere and how this would influence the C14 in the living creatures but we have living creatures that we can date very precisely these are trees by tree dating we can just um, take the amount of C14 that's uh, in the individual tree rings and with that get a um, countermeasure for all these uncertainties or all these um, influencing effects that might be there so this is why dendrodating is the basis for C14 calibration um, because uh, tree rings can be dated accurate to the year a uh, tree ring consists of dead organic matter so C14 is as datable with C14 and if we know how old a s uh, sample should be and how much C14 it has um, then we can come up with an estimation of how much um, C14 was in the atmosphere and um, most of the time we need several measurements uh, so with that we can have a statistical error because every tree ring can of course have also different um, influences or is influenced by diff in different ways by these random processes um, and uh, with that we need a lot of the more datings we have the more tree rings we have the better will be our estimation of the actual amount of C14 in the atmosphere from that the calibration curve uh, results so the calibration curve does not consist only of one BP value per uh, calendar value not only one C14 year per solar year but multiple of them for every um, C14 year and with that it gets it is a band of probabilities so there is a mean value and a standard deviation around the actual measurement and there are um, new C14 curves new calibration curves coming out every five years or so that are more precise and that can also change slightly the dating of archaeological objects with that and to combine these measurements from known age tree rings with measurements of C14 and to come up with a calibrated result we need specific software you can use statistical software like R to do that or there's specific calibration software and there's a bunch of them out there but the current standard I would say is OxCal uh, software that was developed by Professor Bronk Ramsey in the Oxford C14 labs and um, yeah it's a quasi standard nowadays you will see a lot of C14 calibration going on with this software there is an online version available there's also a download version available but it's very well, not very it's it's not straightforward to set this up on your computer so we will work in our practical example with the online version and calibrate with this this is the fly through uh, c14 calibration i hope you learned a bit m new things about what you have probably heard already multiple times in the practical videos we will t shortly talk about how we can very simply um, calibrate an individual um, date what we have to enter the name the uh, date and um, this the standard deviation and then we can select the curve and calibrate we will see how we will are presented with the results of this calibration and how we what we can get out of these different um, possibilities to represent the result and how we can change the look and feel of the calibrated results of this calibration plots here for example to make them uh, helpful for our own investigations and publications and how we need to read these different results yeah that's it for the theoretical part of c14 calibration and as usual you can contact me for any questions and now we'll start recording the practical video for oxcal and we will try this out ourselves in the next practical session.